uh, of genuine wealth, uh, of the good things in life for all of us. That was the purpose for which corporations were created. I want to move from that, really, to what may seem to be a somewhat technical discussion uh, of developments in the way that corporations are owned and controlled today in the global economy. Uh, because, uh, and it, this is actually an extraordinarily important uh, sort of topic within this larger subject. And the reason it's so important is because right now, as we sit in this room, the global economy in certain ways is shifting from the kind of world that Bob Monks described, where pools of capital uh, are relatively transparent, relatively accessible to the ultimate beneficiaries, to one in which they're increasingly not, where pools of capital are increasingly in private hands, unregulated, opaque, unaccountable, and where the motives that drive that capital uh, are increasingly not the sorts of broad long-term motives that Bob was uh, ascribing to pension funds, for example, but increasingly are a very specific, merciless motive. And that motive is to generate, deal by deal, in excess of a 35% of a annual rate of return, no matter what the consequences are in the very short run. And let me explain to you now how that works in brief. First, what are we talking about when we talk about private equity? The term private equity is a kind of lie of the kind that I hope most of you all in this room are familiar with. It is a way of hiding the fact that there's been a boom in leveraged buyouts in the last couple of years. Private equity is a general term that includes things like venture capital funds that seed new enterprises, vulture funds that buy bankrupt businesses, and most importantly, investment funds that borrow money and buy companies with between 10 and 20 percent of the finance of that company coming from the, the private equity firm and 80 to 90 percent of the finance of that acquisition coming from borrowed money. That's a leveraged buyout. If, if you are not familiar with the kind of things that go on around leveraged buyouts, I can recommend some movies to you. <laughs> uh, they're all from my youth uh, because there was a boom of this kind in the late 80s. Uh, you can check out the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas, which I gather is being remade now. Uh, very apropos, and check out the movie Bar Barbarians at the Gate or Other People's Money. All these, all these movies are about the same kinds of transactions and they're actually quite educational. But the term leverage buyout got a very bad reputation because of the deals that occurred in the late 80s and early 90s. Deals like the RJR Nabisco transaction by KKR where 45,000 people lost their jobs. So that when these guys went back into the business in earnest three or four years ago, they didn't want to call themselves LBO funds, so they called themselves private equity. But what they are is the same people doing the same things that they did in the late 80s and early 90s. They do so through unregulated, opaque investment management vehicles. And what does all that mean? That means that unlike a mutual fund, where the, where the people who run a mutual fund have to disclose to the public exactly what they're investing in, how much they're charging you to do it, and what they're going to do in the future, these funds don't have to tell anybody anything. And in particular, they don't have to tell anybody anything after a group of Republican appointees to the D.C. Circuit struck down very modest regulations the SEC had put on hedge funds. The third thing about these kinds of funds to understand is that they charge their investors huge fees. How huge? Bob Monks was talking to you about pension funds, mutual funds. The California Public Employee Retirement System invests about 80% of its assets in indexed equity. That means they buy the whole market, all the stocks of everything available in public, and they pay about one basis point a year to manage their money that way. And what does that mean? A basis point is a hundredth, one one hundredth of one percent. That's very, very cheap money. And it recognizes the fact that if you're a $300 billion fund like CalPERS, you basically own everything. You're not, a, you're not a speculator, you're an investor in the entire economy. Private equity funds and hedge funds have a different fee structure. Their fee structure is something called 2 and 20. Now 2 and 20, by the way, is the bargain basement fee in this area. 
If you're really good at this, you charge more. Now, what does 2 and 20 mean? 2 is 200 basis points. Right? 2 whole percent. And 20 means, so, so there's a baseline fee. 2% of all the assets in these kinds of funds go, is paid to the people managing the money. And on top of that, 20% of the profit made each year by these funds goes to the fund manager over a certain threshold. So the fund will say, well, you know, our goal this year is to do better than the stock market as a whole does on average. So our goal is anything over 8% we get 20% of. So that, portion of, so that portion of pension fund assets that goes into these kinds of funds, right, 2 and 20 goes to the money manager. What's the result of these kinds of structures? An extraordinary concentration of wealth and power that has developed just in the last five years. And to give one example, last year, the 25 top hedge fund managers, I'm not talking about funds, institutions, I'm talking about people, right? Imagine that all the people it would take to fill the first two and a half rows of this room. Their income was t over $10 billion, more than was paid to all of the school teachers in New York City last year. A group of people that, by the way, couldn't be fit, you know, 50, 60, I don't know, 100,000 people, doing perhaps the most valuable work in our society. All the teachers in New York did not make as much money as these 25 people. Now, this type of investing, whether it's in hedge funds or in private equity, and, or, or leveraged buyout funds, has grown enormously. In 2002, leveraged buyout funds took in less than $50 billion from a, of new investment. In 2006, they took in close to $200 billion. There is now $1.5 trillion invested in private equity, most of it in leveraged buyout funds. Hedge funds had $845 million in assets in 2003. They now have over $2.4 trillion. What's the social impact? In the United Kingdom, close to 25% of private sector employees work for a company owned by a private equity fund. Let me, let me just make one further thing clear here. Hedge funds and private equity funds, there's no clear boundary between them. Many hedge funds invest a lot of their assets in private equity funds. Many private equity funds are managed in tandem with hedge funds. These are all legal categories, not economic categories. And what, they, and what they both have in common, whether they're invested in private equity or public equity, is that they're heavily leveraged. They borrow money. And that's principally what drives the high rates of returns they promise their investors, is that they borrow money so that, so that if, they, if they also the upside belongs disproportionately to the equity investors, but if things go badly, they will go badly very quickly and very severely for everyone involved. Why? Why all this growth in these areas? It's not because, I'm afraid, that the people who run them are geniuses, although some of them are fairly smart. So the people who run mutual funds are fairly smart. There's a lot of smart people in the world. These, partic these particular structures have turned out to be very effective, not because people are smart, but because of a series of structural and legal subsidies that these type of investments have received. The first, is that there are huge regulatory loopholes that allow these types of funds to, to conduct their business essentially without regulation. Loopholes in our securities laws, loopholes in our pension laws, ERISA, that basically mean that if you create these, if you manage money in these legal categories, you don't have to tell anybody what you're doing and you don't have to obey any rules, short of fraud. You can't commit fraud even in these categories. Secondly, and most importantly, there are enormous tax subsidies to, these, to this form of investment. And there are two kinds of tax subsidies. One is that corporate debt, payments on corporate debt are deductible from corporate taxes and payments to corporate shareholders are not. I asked the economic staff of the OECD in Paris, which represents the governments of all the developed countries, is there any economic basis for this, for this particular subsidy? And their answer was, there's none. But we have to say that really quietly because if we say it, the public will be fired. The second kind of tax subsidy that's gotten a lot of attention recently, because it's so outrageous, is that, remember going back to the previous slide, that 20%, that 20% of the upside? That is taxed at capital gains rates. 
And it goes directly to the managers of these companies, those 25 people with the $10 billion in annual income. They're paying 15% tax rates on that money. 